Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this biodiversity themed webinar. Uh, it's been organized by the Earth Journalism Network, which is a program of the media development organization Internews. For those of you who don't know, the Earth Journalism Network or EJN exists to improve the quality and the quantity of biodiversity coverage and other environmental issues in the, in the media. And over the past 15 years or so, it's trained more than 8,000 journalists around the world to report on these topics. You can find more uh, information and join the network if you're interested at earthjournalism.net. The aim of today's webinar is to inform journalists and other professional communicators about the latest assessment of the state of biodiversity and about the changes that are needed to protect and secure the benefits that biodiversity provides to us. And we also want to help journalists prepare to cover the negotiations that are taking place under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity towards a new global agreement on biodiversity, which countries are set to agree in China next year. Uh, to those of you listening in, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, uh, please use the chat box in Zoom and we will use them in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And speaking of panelists, before I introduce them, I'd like to acknowledge up front that due to un unforeseen circumstances, we have ended up with an all male panel, which is not ideal. We, we had intended to hear from Joji Carino, um, an Iboloi Igorot woman from the Philippines, who's a senior policy advisor with the Forest Peoples Program and co-lead author of the local biodiversity outlooks report that came out last month. Unfortunately, she cannot be with us and she's, ha she's having some problems getting onto the internet. And replacing her will be Maurizio Farhan Ferrari, who's also a policy senior policy advisor with the Forest Peoples Programme and also a co-lead author of the local biodiversity outlooks report. Maurizio, Maurizio thank you for stepping in at the last moment. Uh, we also had hoped to have David Cooper, the deputy executive director, uh, deputy executive secretary of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, but he's been called away on some urgent business and in his place is David Ainsworth who is the uh, head of communications at the CBD Secretariat and our final panelist is Eric Dinnerstein. Eric is the director of biodiversity and wildlife solutions program at the non-governmental organization Resolve and he's a former chief scientist of the World Wildlife Fund. David, Eric and Maurizio thank you all for being here um, before we get into things, I'd like to ask you all a quick question. Uh, you've all been working on biodiversity for many years, but to many of the journalists watching this, this may be a new topic, and, and certainly for many of them, their editors will be even less familiar with this topic. So can you each tell me in just one sentence why media coverage of biodiversity matters? Uh, let's start with uh, Eric. Sure, and thank you for inviting me. In one sentence, biodiversity is what sustains us. It's what sustains human civilization. And without nature, civilization could not progress. It provides us with the clean water, the clean air, um, the, the, the fertile soils that we need to survive. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Maurizio, can you add a, a sentence of your own, please? Um, yeah, I fully agree with what Eric said. I, I would add that, um, Together with climate change, um, biodiversity loss is one of the greatest challenges facing humankind as we, you know, in the current century. And uh, whatever decision will be taken in the next few years will have immense consequences for the future of um, all the generations to come, apart from our own generation. Thanks. Thanks, Maurizio. And uh, David, can you add your sentence now, please? Yeah, addressing biodiversity loss uh, in a sustained way will allow us to address a number of other interrelated challenges relating to food security, water security, climate, and indeed human rights as well. Thank you all. Now, David, uh, 10 years ago, I, I came to the CBD Secretariat and everyone in the building was working out flat out completely uh, uh, high levels of stress, high levels, <laughs> high levels of coffee. And uh, they were preparing for a big meeting in Japan where the conference of parties was taking place. This is where the, all, the, all of the countries that are party to the CBD were gathering to complete their negotiations. And that meeting ended with the countries agreeing 20 targets, the so-called Aichi targets. So I'd like to hand over to you now so you can give us a presentation about what happened next. 
and what journalists should know about something called GBO5. Perfect. Great. Thanks very, very much. And David Cooper sends his regrets, uh, partly due to the pandemic situation. A lot of things are, you know, being juggled around at the last minute, so he's not able to join us. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, Mike, it's it's good for us to be talking now because 10 years ago, uh, we were indeed, uh, uh, you know, thinking about uh, a 10 year a strategic plan for biodiversity, 10 years of action that we're going to set the planet on the course towards a, uh, a sustainable relationship uh, with uh, life on earth. And we're at the end of the 10 years uh, and we are at the time where we take that stock taking, look at where we're at and tell us what did that, that set for us as far as our path going forward. And the best way for me to explain and look at that is to do that through uh, the results of Global Biodiversity Outlook 5, which was released uh, just a little over a month ago. And Global Biodiversity Outlook 5 is essentially the report card on where we've been at with uh, action for biodiversity and uh, where we should be going. I'm just going to share my screen, everyone. So I'll put together a few slides here and see how that works. Uh, let's see here. It looks like I am sharing it, so you'll have to can maybe someone just give me an indication that that looks fine? You can see all of that. Are we okay there? Yeah, that looks good. Perfect, okay, very good. So Global Biodiversity Outlook 5, I mean, there've been a number of reports that have come out over this fall that have provided an assessment and even last year's assessment, you know, about the FS report. So this is uh, our final assessment uh, on what happened the last 10 years and what's going to take place moving forward. Um, this shows you that it's not, it's based on a significant data set, uh, national reports from around the world, national biodiversity strategies and action plans, uh, citations, academic literature, and all those reports listed up top. So it's knowledge base that allowed us to put together this report is indeed considerable. So with this report, this summary of the 10 years, there are three sections that we look at. We look at the relationship of biodiversity for sustainable development. The second part is this report card on how the world is done for these 20 biodiversity targets created in 2010. And the final section is looking forward. What are the pathways that we need to do to achieve this idea of a vision of life and harmony with nature? So the first part on biodiversity for sustainable development really asserts the important two-way relationship between the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda and indeed biodiversity. It points out that there's an impact both ways. You know, protecting biodiversity has a positive impact on most of the sustainable development goals and also achievement of the sustainable development goals has an impact on what happens with biodiversity. This is important because it shows us the way that all of these different relationships uh, and, and issues we're dealing with are related, as I said in my introductory sentence to the report. Now, just going very, very quickly, the main focus of Global Biodiversity Outlook 5 is indeed how did we do on these targets. Governments have been working for 10 years now on a whole variety of targets and what was our level of achievement for it. If you decide to open up the report, which I rec recommend you do, you'll find that for each biodiversity target, we've done an analysis, about two to four pages each, that looks at the progress, how it relates to SDGs, narrative reports, and indicators as well. So, what we did is when we did the analysis from all the different countries, we did an aggregate and you'll see that the color coding here in the report will tell you how things have done. How have countries, if they have been on track to exceed the target, which is in blue, uh, have they on, been on track to reach the target in green? Uh, some progress, but not at a rate that would allow them to achieve the target. Um, and then we start to get into danger zones after that. No significant change or in fact, moving away from the target. So what you see here in these bar line graphs are a bit of an indication of how all of the parties that are, are under the convention reported with regard to this. So those figures from the national levels were essentially aggregated and provided us our, our knowledge of what happened at the global level. So the overall report card is like this. And I don't know if any of you are still getting report cards for college courses, or you've got children who are getting report cards. But if you looked at this, you would see that there are a few areas that are great, but for the most part, things are moving forward, but we need more work. Yellow is the dominant color, which means that parties have made progress, but they haven't been doing it at a fast enough rate to achieve the targets uh, and goals. And then for some, uh, it hasn't moved forward. You'll note that we see some green in targets 11, uh, 17. Uh, we're looking at uh, a number nine, 19 and 20. It's things like that making progress indeed, but a lot not really moving forward. So the overall assessment is, is that progress has been made, but more work has to be done. 
Let me go through some of the success stories, though, that will allow us to understand some of the lessons. So first of all, we know that indeed governments are paying attention to biodiversity. Biodiversity values are now incorporated into uh, the systems of environmental economic accounting started to move on board. Uh, we also know that as a result of efforts, uh, the rate of deforestation has fallen globally by about a third compared to the previous decade. If you look at this graph, you'll see that while we also have uh, good forest expansion in some areas, the rate of deforestation has been reduced. And that's mostly uh, due to activities that have taken place in Latin America, uh, for the most part, as you can see that. So we have been having successes with regard to that. We also can say that governments uh, in about half of the fisheries where good management policies have been introduced, things like stock assessments, catch limits, and indeed enforcement, um, marine stocks have been maintained or have actually grown again. So where policies are implemented, they make a difference. We also see that in the case of invasive alien species on islands, important eradication programs have made a massive difference and in fact have made uh, a, a really positive benefits to a lot of the endemic species that we see uh, on a lot of these, uh, these areas. We can also say the famous uh, target 11, which is about protected areas on the planet. Uh, the protected areas in terrestrial and marine areas are uh, uh, looking to be on track to achieve the 17 and 10% areas by this time. You'll also note that if you look at the commitments area that's moving forward, there's a strong sign that commitments that are being made to the future will take us well above and launch us uh, for um, a strong level of protection. And the other thing too, is that's not the only element of it, but indeed the protection of areas of particular importance for biodiversity has also increased. That's an important target. And we can talk more about that in the discussion area. The other thing too, is that we can say that notwithstanding the bad figures we've seen with regard to overall species, we can say that conservation actions appear to have worked. Uh, so if the CBD and these actions didn't exist, species would be in a much worse situation. And so we're seeing a number of species that have been uh, have been saved. Um, in this picture you see the ferret taken from Joel Sartori is an example of one of those species that has been saved as a result of these integrated conservation actions. Uh, other success stories relate to whether or not we've helped, helped to enable implementation, the Nagoya Protocol and access to genetic resources uh, and the equitable sharing of their benefits, uh, which came into force or which was negotiated in 2010 and came into force during this decade, is uh, in force and fully operational with at least 87 countries. And so you'll see that we're getting a strong growth in this one aspect of the CBD, the, um, the equitable sharing of benefits, which is the third objective. We're also seeing that, in fact, the planning, the strategies and action plans are now being updated in line with the strategic plan. So these are documents that used to become just very unstrategic and now they're indeed lined up with the global priorities. We've also seen that the availability of data and information available to citizens uh, and researchers and policymakers, including through important citizen science areas, has grown significantly through this period. And then the final success story is related to the target on financial resources. We have indeed seen uh, uh, a doubling of the resources available for biodiversity work. So in the middle of all of this, uh, looking at elements that were yellow, we're also seeing uh, uh, some strong moving forward. So these are some of the lessons that we've got forward. We can talk to this more during the discussion period. So the thing that we've learned is while we're making progress, we really need greater efforts to direct the, to address the direct and indirect drivers of biodiversity loss. And we need greater interaction amongst a variety of stakeholders for that. We also know that the integration of gender and the role of IPLCs and stakeholders needs to be further strengthened if we're gonna make a difference policy-wise. We need to look at the targets and make sure they're indeed smart. Um, the question of these national biodiversity strategies and action plans or NBSAPs needs to be strengthened. While they're getting stronger, they need to be an overall whole of government policy approach. Uh, and I think the important thing is about time lags. With much of the work that we did during this decade, work didn't start till halfway into the decade. And so the time lag period has got to be addressed. We need to be more ambitious, as you can see, under point number six. And then we need to pay attention to implementation and make sure that we're targeting support for countries. So all of these lessons will be incorporated and discussed as we plan the next round of biodiversity targets uh, setting forward from here on to the next 10 years. So with regard to looking forward, the third part of the outlook says 
So what do we need to get to this 2050 vision for biodiversity, which is living in harmony with nature? So the first thing is we need to look at overall, if we're going to bend the curve on biodiversity loss, we need not just bold conservation and restoration action, but we also need to make changes in agricultural production and trade and consumption patterns. These graphs show you that if we continue the ways business as usual, we will continue the rate of loss. But what they also show that is that conservation, while it will make a difference, it's not all. We needed integrated actions with a whole variety of areas to ensure that we truly will bend the curve in biodiversity loss. And so you can see here is that that bending the curve requires a lot of important slices that we're going to move forward on. And those slices are in a variety of different policy areas, and those are outlined in GBO5. Building on the work that was done in the IPBES assessment last year, we talk about eight transitions that are needed, and you can see them here. These transitions uh, uh, range from the way we deal with lands and forests, uh, fresh waters, agriculture, food systems, climate action, and indeed uh, looking at the One Health transition, which, which was raised uh, in prominence as a result of the pandemic actions. GBO5 looks at each of these transitions. It talks about what the transition is, what the rationale and the benefits are, what the components might be for that transition, and the progress that's actually being done already towards this transition. So let me just go through a couple of them quickly. First of all, it's very clear that we need a sustainable food systems transition. That's about agricultural policies, diet consumption and the way that we deal with food waste uh, in this area. So that's one important uh, food systems transition. The other part is the climate action transition. Nature-based solutions to the climate challenge could represent up to 30% of what we need to do to achieve uh, the Paris Accord. And so this transition finds a way for us to deal with decarbonizing our economy while also saving biodiversity and using biodiversity as a tool towards that. And then finally, uh, in this pandemic context, a biodiversity inclusive one health transition uh, is discussed and it's raised as important. This is a way where we can look at human health, animal health and ecosystem management in a way together that produce, produces outcomes for all of these different areas. As you can see, these transitions are related. This graph shows you how uh, work on land, on sea and urban and other settings is related and has to be worked on together as well. So just quickly, first of all, so we can say that after 10 years, unfortunately, we have met none of the IHG biodiversity targets. There are, however, many examples of success. And the lesson is that policy measures work when they're implemented. So therefore, it is possible to reduce and reverse biodiversity loss uh, and plan for recovery towards the 2050 vision. But we need strong conservation and restoration actions. And we need to address all of the drivers, and in particular, sustainable consumption. Uh, the biodiversity outlook uses the phrase humanity is at a crossroads, and that's true. We do need to make these choices now. So now as we plan the next framework, this is where we need to move forward. So thanks, and I look forward to the other uh, comments and questions from everyone else, and uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll move forward. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. That was, that was a really interesting overview of... of uh, sorry, uh, of uh, the report. I've, I'm just going to throw in one of the questions that came up during uh, from one of our um, viewers who has said, when it comes to decreased deforestation that you mentioned, is that purely because deforestation globally is, is falling or is it that reforestation in some places is offsetting the, the continued deforestation in others? No, you'll notice on that particular slide, there are two components of it. So the upper level of the bars, we're talking about increase in forest cover. And so that's actually about, you know, reforestation, afforestation, all of those areas there. The lower part of the graph talks about actual slowing in rates of deforestation. And as you can see, that change is really largely based on what took place in Latin America. Um, uh, it is important to note that in Brazil for much of the decade, although not all the years, there were important initiatives that significantly reduced deforestation rates in there. Uh, they did. Uh, unfortunately, as we know, some have been backtracking that policy in the last few years. And you, you mentioned the pandemic a couple of times, and obviously it's affecting everything everywhere. But in terms of the uh, negotiations towards a new global framework on biodiversity, has, uh, has the pandemic affected the substance of things in any way? I know that meetings have been delayed and that schedule has been changed, but is there any added urgency now that people are starting to think a bit more maybe about how uh, deforestation and wildlife trade are massive risk factors for future pandemics. 
or has COVID-19 drawn attention away from biodiversity as, as governments are focused on the recovery and the immediate uh, response to the pandemic? I, I think overall the pandemic uh, and our understanding of how it emerged has really highlighted uh, to the general public and to a variety of policymakers uh, the consequence of biodiversity loss. So I think that's positive. We've got a greater awareness of nature and biodiversity loss and the consequences of whether it's the wildlife trade or indeed ecosystem fragmentation. So that means that there's increased focus. It's, it's done this other part, which is to say that this isn't just about species loss. This is about um, creating conditions that make us more vulnerable as human beings. So in that respect, there's a positive uh, on that area. So the negotiations will be taking more account of the one health transition than I think they were previously. So that's one part. Now, with regard to the negative effects of the pandemic, uh, obviously, you know, the focus now is going to be on uh, economic recovery, on public health measures. Um, and uh, there's also a concern of, has the pandemic made it harder for governments to police and monitor overall problems uh, with uh, biodiversity loss? And I think there is evidence that the ability to continue to monitor and enforce uh, regulations has been compromised. So that'll have to be taken apart. The other concern is that recovery for uh, from COVID-19 and the pandemics is happening right now. And are governments indeed, you know, taking biodiversity into account in these recovery plans being rolled out right now? And that's an important aspect that has to be pressured right now for governments. Thanks a lot, David. Um, on the same day that the GBO5 came out, there was another report that the CBD Secretariat published, and this is something called the Local Biodiversity Outlooks. So I'd like to pass over now to Maurizio, who was one of the co-authors of that report, uh, and ask him to tell us what it is, why it matters, and what it concluded. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, Giorgi Carigno, who is um, the lead uh, Indigenous author, was supposed to be here with us today uh, to present this one. He's apologizing for not being able to join due to technical uh, difficulties. So I'll, um, I'm stepping in on uh, her behalf. Um, yes, so the LBO2, that was the second edition, was launched together with the fifth edition of um, the Global Biodiversity Outlook um, last month. Just to give a little bit, um, very brief history, the first edition was launched uh, in 2016 at the Conference of the Parties uh, in Mexico as a complement to GBO4, which had been launched a year earlier in 2015, to take stock of the midterm review of the current strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020. The main reason for that was that the indigenous peoples and local communities, organizations that uh, attend CBD meetings and are, are fully engaged in the implementation of the convention, felt that the global biodiversity outlook, while very useful, didn't uh, uh, present as many local realities from the ground as they would have liked to be presenting. So there was a discussion with the Secretariat to actually develop a complementary report that focuses on the contributions of indigenous peoples and local communities at the grassroots level, at the local level, where biodiversity is located. And um, so the LBO1 was launched in 2016, at the same meeting, the parties welcomed the report and asked the Secretariat to, um, to develop a second edition in conjunction with GBO5. And just, that's why uh, LBO2 and GBO5 were, were launched together last month. Um, the LBO2 basically highlights over 50 stories by indigenous peoples and local communities authors from around the world presenting the perspective and experiences of indigenous people and local communities on the current social ecological crisis, their contribution to the UN decade on biodiversity and local solutions really across biodiversity, climate change and sustainable development because they see the three as uh, being very strongly interrelated in a, in a, in a holistic way. Um, in many global reports and mainstream media about biodiversity and climate, local and cultural perspectives as lived by indigenous and local communities are often missing or marginalized. So the, the report seeks to address that gap by making visible the contributions of IPLCs. And uh, we have to say that these voices are often quite quiet and unheard, and when loudly voiced have been in many cases violently suppressed or silenced as evidenced by the increasing number 
of indigenous human rights and environmental defenders being killed. Uh, this publication is therefore dedicated to those heroes at the, at the local level who stand up day in and day out to protect their lands and the biodiversity at the local level. Now, what are the, I would like to present, um, to share probably five, five um, key messages emerging from LDO2. The first one links uh, local to global levels and the failure to recognize uh, IPRC's collective actions at the local level. So while we all agree that agreements and actions at the global level are important, the LDO2 case studies remind us that biodiversity is place located and that solutions to this global crisis need to be in place at all levels, from the local to the national, regional and international level. Activities and actions by IPRCs at the local level therefore play a vital role in solving global challenges. What has been emerging from um, the LBO2 and also from associated literature is that the contributions of IPRCs to biodiversity conservation, sustainable use, restorations and benefit sharing are still unfortunately largely ignored. Only 10% of parties have reported including IPLCs in their national biodiversity strategies and action plans. And reporting has been piecemeal, focused mostly on projects and activities, and the abducted indicators on traditional knowledge in the CBD have not really been applied at the national level. So one of the key things, uh, key messages, was, is that ongoing disregard of culture-based solutions and IPLCs contribution has been a major missed opportunity in the past decade. And this neglect has affected the underachievement of all of the 20 IHE biodiversity targets. Because LDO2 actually shows through case studies that IPLCs are contributing to all of those 20 IHE targets. This needs to be seen as an important lesson in order to, to avoid repeating failure in the future. So putting the cultures and rights of indigenous peoples and local communities at the heart of the 2050 biodiversity strategy would deliver sustainable livelihoods and well-being and positive outcomes for both biodiversity and climate. This is strongly supported by evidence that indigenous peoples have been the best stewards of biological diversity, especially within their ancestral territories. The second key message is, uh, which is partly related to the first one, is that nature and culture work together. So we cannot really look at biodiversity without taking into account culture and, bi and, bi and, and biological, and, uh, sorry, and cultural diversity as well. The LBO2 also highlights that overcoming dualism, separation and imbalances in the relationship between human and nature is central to addressing the biodiversity and health crisis, including the rise of pandemics like COVID-19, um, for example. And that indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing evoke new narratives and visions of culture and nature working together uh, rather than separate entities. So science, sciences needs indigenous and local knowledge to solve contemporary problems with holism and reciprocity. So the LBO reference to values such as reciprocity and collective rights and responsibilities indicate that we need to address deep values in society and behaviors in order to solve the biodiversity crisis. Um, the third element emerging is on the importance of IPLC's lands in sustainable management and conservation of biodiversity. The IBES Global Assessment on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services launched in 2019 shows that much of the world's biodiversity is located on the lands of IPLC's. Approximately 35% of the global area that is formally protected and 35% of all remaining terrestrial areas with low human intervention and reaching biodiversity overlap with indigenous land. When the lands of local communities are added, these percentages are even higher. Current estimates suggest that lands under the communal management of IPLCs range up to at least 50% of the world's land area covering a wide range of biomes, including forests, rangelands, deserts, and coastal and marine areas. However, recent studies estimate that only about 10% of these lands are protected through collective land titles. 
Many of these areas, as highlighted by the IBES Global Assessment, have become islands of biodiversity surrounded by a sea of destruction and are under increasing pressure from land grabbing and unsustainable development. So urgent action is needed to support IPLCs to protect their lands and their rights. The fourth element is the need to recognize and address real challenges on the ground. The LBO highlights that the efforts of IPLCs are not sufficiently recognized by governments and that the vested interest driving biodiversity loss and human rights violations remain insufficiently addressed. This needs to change, including through regulation, collaboration and partnerships to effectively address the real drivers of biodiversity loss, including a sustainable production and consumption. It's clear that a systemic transformation is needed, not just cosmetic fixes. And the last um, um, key message emerging from the LBO2, which is uh, one full part of the report dedicated to it. Um, like you know, in GBO5, there, uh, as presented by David, there were eight uh, transitions. So the LBO2 also based on those case studies and all the voices coming from the local level, compiled uh, six transitions. And these complement the sectoral transitions recommended in GBO5, but from the point of view of um, IPLCs. So these six critical transitions include one on land, focusing on securing land rights and customary land tenure of indigenous peoples and local communities, as that will also secure biodiversity. Um, a second one on food, by revitalizing indigenous and local sustainable food systems will shift us away from unsustainable industrial agriculture towards agroecology and food sovereignty and food security. A third one on culture, by valuing and recognizing diver diverse ways of knowing and doing, which are fundamental to find local solutions that contribute to transformative change. A fourth one on governance, focused on inclusive decision-making and self-determined development of IPLCs to end discrimination and exclusion in social and political life. Uh, a fifth one on economies, focusing on sustainable use of resources and the flourishing of diverse local economies away from extra extractive capitalism and gross social inequalities. And a fifth one on incentives and finance, rewarding effective local IPRC solutions and stop financing destruction, as it is still well known and also which was highlighted actually in GBO5, that um, one of the key failures has been the, uh, uh, the failure to tackle um, perverse incentives um, in, in, the, in, the, in the past 10 years. So that needs to be addressed uh, with urgency as well. So these, one, these, these six uh, transitions are, we see them as intergenerational, intergenerational visions, honoring the historical struggles and wisdom of past generations drawing from the experiences and innovations of today's living generations and embodying the legacy and hopes for future generations. And it's actually good to remark that a number of indigenous youth participated in the development of LBO2 and provided case studies in the publications as well. And we feel that they, you know, these contribute to humanity's joint endeavor to save our common home. I will uh, probably share the link to the LBO2 on the chat in just a few seconds. Thanks a lot, Mike, and thanks everybody. Thanks, Maurizio. And those are some really clear and strong recommendations and they're all based in um, a huge body of evidence now and also experience that, that shows just how important indigenous peoples and their management systems are to protecting biodiversity. But are these, are these messages, are these uh, positions able to influence the negotiations towards a, a new global agreement? Because the, the CBD itself is made up of parties, which are governments. So governments are negotiating, governments are agreeing targets collectively, and then governments are doing the implementation of those uh, of the work towards those targets. So what is the space in the CBD process for indigenous peoples uh, to, to have a say? 
uh, and are they being listened to? Uh, yeah, that's a very critical question. <laughs> I think the space in the CBD is is there. Um, I think is one of the intergovernmental agreements that actually has made space for indigenous peoples and local communities. So I think um, we actually need to thank the you know the secretariat for having contributing to making that space, both in terms of providing space in physical meetings and also in supporting publications like the the local biodiversity outlook. Of course, there is a very big challenge, uh, you know, that not many representatives of the IPLCs, you know, can travel to international meetings or even can attend webinars just because of, you know, the technical difficulties. So that will be a challenge that will be continue to be addressed. But nevertheless, the uh, IPLCs through a number of networks, including the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity and the Indigenous Women Biodiversity Network, they've been active in the convention and their voices have been increasingly heard, I think, by parties. I don't think that their voices and aspirations and you know, demands, uh, even though very well evidenced you know, from the ground and from emerging li literature, have been completely taken into account yet by parties negotiating you know, the CB, the, you know, the CBD provisions and the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So there is a very strong call here to make sure that these voices and these recommendations will be taken into account in the next few months before COP15, um, because in the, the next few months will be critical to, to develop the next strategic plan of the convention. So there is hope that they will be taken into account, but I think only time will tell. And um, I think the more parties become open to, um, well, not only to listen, but also to make space for uh, the participation of um, IPLCs, but not only at IPLCs, you know, it's also women, youth, civil society in general. Saving biodiversity uh, is not a matter of governments only. And I think everybody's realizing that. It's got to be um, an effort across society and uh, it was already recognized in Nagoya 10 years ago, but unfortunately, I don't think there has been enough effort being made to, to mainstream biodiversity and to mainstream participation of all, you know, of all of society in achieving these objectives. I think that's one of the key governance issues that will need, will need to be addressed, and uh, it, it needs to be taken into account in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, both in terms of mechanisms for implementation monitoring, reporting, and, and full participation. Great, thank you, Maurizio. And I think in what you've just said, you've answered one of the questions that has come in on the chat here. Uh, I'd like to move over and talk to, to Eric now, because David and Maurizio have both mentioned protected areas at some point. And um, in, the, in the new global framework, there's going to be uh, a proposal for a, a new target called the 30 by 30 target, which would, uh, would set a target of protecting 30% of the earth by, by 2030. Um, Eric, you've published research recently that calls not for 30, but for 50%. Can you uh, tell us a bit about your work and the idea of a planetary safety net? Sure. Uh, let me start by saying <clears throat> that uh, thanks for being here and being able to inject some science into the conversation. The, the science I'll present will largely support what Maurizio just presented, maybe the scientific component with the traditional component, but it will be a bit in stark contrast to what David presented uh, in the sense that um, I'll, I'll start out very, very pessimistic and then end very hopeful in the same place that David's probably heading. Um, having attended the CBD in Rome just before the outbreak uh, of COVID there in, in Italy, uh, observing what I thought was the, the marginal progress that was made. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. About a year ago, uh, some of the world's leading scientists and I over a several year period gathered together and published a paper calling for a global deal for nature published in Science Advances. And that was to pair with the Paris Climate Agreement in part because we felt that uh, for too long and even, even through now, um, we have uh, atmospheric scientists operating in one silo and biodiversity scientists in another. And in fact, the two conventions are interdependent and they're both going to fail unless they are, are engaged and interact together. We simply can't save biodiversity 
without staying below 1.5 degrees in global average temperature rise. And we can't stay below 1.5 unless we save biodiversity. So the global deal for nature was a time-bound science-based approach to how to save life on earth. And what we looked at were area-based targets for protecting nature, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine, and then policy decisions, policy um, milestones and targets that we needed to meet to save life on earth. In fact, we're all uh, somewhat quarantined now. If we'd only adopted and en enacted one of the policy recommendations of shutting down wildlife markets and ending the illegal trade in wildlife, we wouldn't be facing uh, this zoonotic spillover that we have now in coronavirus or, uh, or ones that will to come. So here's the problem. We're facing four interacting existential crises for the future of life on Earth. It's the, the sixth greatest great extinction in the history of Earth, but the only one that humans are involved in. Um, climate breakdown, ecosystem collapse, which has not gotten enough attention, and pandemics. And we came out with a new paper called the Global Safety Net just uh, last month, also in Science Advances, that's the first ever map of what we can do on Earth to, to, to preserve civilization, essentially. The critical issue is that we have to act quickly. Um, the, the, the graph that David showed of bending the curve just doesn't fit what we know about science. Now, if this were the year 1920, or 1950 instead of 2020, we could talk about bending a curve. The reality is we have about 10 years to achieve success in getting on the right trajectories and greatly advancing protection. Now, we've called in our global safety net paper for protecting up to 50% of the terrestrial realm of Earth. And we map that out. Uh, you can go to global safety net um, dot app and see a video and a map that shows all this in living color. What this does is it tries to depict for the first time the work of the world's leading global biodiversity scientists in 11 data layers of what we need to protect life on earth. It ranges from the rarest species on earth, the, the rarest endemics that species that live in very small areas to the wide ranging species to intact wilderness. But what we do that's unique is we compare that and overlay that in Google Earth Engine. So this is a dynamic analysis that can be made available and isn't made available to every country in the world that can be updated quickly. The carbon values, so the total carbon, the amount of carbon stored in the above ground biomass, the trees and other vegetation, the below ground biomass and, and the carbon and the soil carbon as well, all three together and then evaluate each of these layers for every country and every ecoregion on earth, what they could contribute. And so here are some really important headlines. First of all, this is all doable. Uh, there's at least 50% uh, of the earth's terrestrial realm that is either intact, semi-intact, or slightly degraded, but could be restored. Now, of that, about 15% is currently protected. And, and, and David's mentioned that with the Aichi targets that the target was 17% um, for, for 2020. That's a political decision. It's not a science-based one and it's far too small. What we need is to protect all of that habitat in the next, um, in the next 10 years. And, and here's how we can do that. And here are here are four important headlines from our study that journalists can use. The first is that one of these targets is uh, the rare species on earth. And, and these are the places where extinction is going to happen the fastest. And the great headline here is that we only have to conserve another 2.3% of the earth's surface to protect most of the rare threatened endangered species, terrestrial species on earth. That's doable, that, that could be achieved in three years and that should be one of our targets. The next critical headline or important headline is, is emphasizes what Maurizio had presented is that about 35% of the safety net is either under tenure or titled or claimed by or occupied by indigenous peoples. And that's critical because you, know, you could argue that this goal of 30% by 2030, we're actually already there. If you do some 
some creative accounting here, you can show that the lands that are under indigenous management bring us to that total. So, so why advocate for a total of 30% by 2030 here in 2020 when we're already there? So we should be far more ambitious. The important thing is that the indigenous lands, not assuming that indigenous peoples want to be part of this and over 150 indigenous communities have signed on to the global deal for nature, assuming that they are part of this global effort, that that addresses uh, the need to conserve the vast carbon stores on earth because most of those are in the areas that are um, governed by or sovereign to indigenous peoples. Now, the, the, another headline and the third headline is the paper for the first time ever asks the question and answers it. Globally, what would it take to connect all the world's national parks, protected areas and intact habitats with corridors? People have done this and I have done this myself as part of my research on, on tigers and rhinos in Nepal, creating corridors to connect habitats from parks um, that are too small by themselves, but together become a larger network of parks. But nobody's ever asked the question, what would it take to do this globally so that not only we could connect wildlife parks where elephants and tigers could move back and forth, say, or jaguars, but also as climates change, how we can be able to uh, provide climate corridors for species that move more slowly to move from A to B as the climate envelope shifts with climate change or climate breakdown? And the answer is remarkable. If we implemented the safety net, it would only take another 2.7% of the Earth's surface to connect all the world's uh, uh, national parks and reserves and intact habitats. So those are all very exciting, but perhaps the most exciting part of this really is that the cost of this effort to, to save not only life on earth, but, but the future of human civilization is a fraction of what we're spending now to combat the coronavirus. Uh, I was part of a recent study um, led by David Waldron of about 100 scientists that estimated that the cost of, well, it's cost of achieving 30 by 30, 2030 is about um, 100 to $150 billion a year. Now think of what we're spending now on, on addressing the coronavirus pandemic and that we've already had uh, since uh, the start of this century in the last 20 years, we've already had 14 zoonotic spillovers that have led to outbreaks of diseases. We're guaranteed to have more. So we can think of the safety net, not only as protecting biodiversity, but what we're also calling pandemic prevention areas. It's predicted that the next pandemic will likely come from a zoonotic spillover in the Amazon. We've already seen Zika virus and others, but there's more to come. The way to prevent that is to keep tropical habitats intact and stop deforestation and be able um, to reduce contact zones with humans and interiors of tropical forests where many diseases, many viruses occur and naturally. So this approach to the safety net can address all four of these existential crises at once, climate breakdown, biodiversity loss and, and recovery, uh, pandemic prevention and preventing ecosystem collapse. But we have to do this quickly. We can't wait um, till 2050. We have to achieve these targets uh, by 2030. So not only I think we have to look beyond the CBD. We have to have a, a citizen science movement. We have to have indigenous peoples. We have to have young leaders like Greta Thunberg calling for a new uh, approach, a new era of planetary stewardship of the earth. And I think that's all doable. I think that's all possible. We've seen the dramatic changes we can make in response to a global pandemic. We have um, much greater curves to flatten ahead of us, but. Uh, we think that this is all possible in part because it's not going to be very expensive. It's a fraction of what we're spending now and it ensures the future of civilization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. That's it's really fascinating work and I've, I've shared the link to your study in the, uh, in the chat here so people can, can go and find that and find your contact details and follow up with you. We, um, we're, we're running a little short on time now, so I'd like to just maybe go to some of the questions that have come in uh, during during the webinar. 
Um, one question uh, from Nirmal Raj is, what measures will be taken to maximize awareness about biodiversity among students and, and others around the world? Um, and is there more, are there more plans for the participation of volunteer organizations, more volunteer organizations in protecting nature? And I think maybe David, I'd like to ask you that question about the uh, raising awareness, because it seems that some people know an awful lot about this and know what needs to happen. And an awful lot of people are extremely detached from nature and, and don't know what the problem is, don't know why biodiversity matters to them. So what is, is the CBD, D, CBD doing something? Are parties to the CBD required to do something to, to raise awareness about these issues? Thanks very much. Uh, it's true that the, uh, the rate of increase of people's knowledge of what biodiversity is and how it impacts their life, uh, it's also increasing, as we report in GBO5, but not fast enough. We know that people don't, haven't really drawn the connections. Um, uh, and parties are mandated, you know, they were mandated under that first target to carry out those measures to move forward, and some did some. Uh, I think it's important to note that there were advances made in that, but a lot more has to go forward. I mean, one thing that's interesting and positive is, you know, we're in the biodiversity community, but the, the notion of that the term nature and biodiversity are synonymous or the relationship is something that's come into play over the last couple of years, and that's one way that we've gotten some traction uh, with people uh, as well. Uh, so we're looking at that. But I think this is a job that's more than just governments, just like, you know, Eric and Maritza both said, this is just beyond the governments as well. Thanks up to a lot of different organizations in society to help build that awareness. Um, we're starting to see some of that, though. I mean, you could, I could say that from 2019 onwards, the, the references to biodiversity or nature in the press have increased greatly. Uh, people are starting to become more, a segment of society is more aware of how the things they eat uh, are related to biodiversity, so, it's, so it, it is there. But indeed, it's a bigger, bigger effort that needs to be carried out. It is beyond the CBD. It's about what happens for, for example, the food agriculture organization, what they do. Um, it's about, you know, what civil society organizations and others as well. And as, as the uh, CBD process goes on and as we enter the UN decade on uh, ecological restoration, we're going to be hearing lots and lots of um, stuff about new projects that either plan to protect areas or to restore uh, ecosystems. Uh, Eric, what questions should journalists be asking when they hear about these sorts of projects in their local areas uh, from a scientific perspective? Because I think yeah, sure. So, um, you know, some people have facetiously said, some scientists said, well, we really, we, what we need to do is we need to pull down about 392 gigatons of, of carbon dioxide uh, into the soil. Let's just create great eucalyptus plantations. Well, that, that's a really bad idea, you know, because eucalyptus is all over the world. It's great in Australia. It's a beautiful species, a, a genus. Uh, lots of species, but what uh, the point I'm making here is we don't want to plant exotic species. What we need to do is plant native trees. You know, you know with all the great science we've done, uh, no one has ever come up with uh, an invention that is more efficient than a tree, than a tropical tree, uh, is that they are incredible machines for sucking down carbon dioxide and putting it into the, into the biomass in the soil. If we are able to, if, if we took our global safety net map and we united that with say the bond challenge, which calls a, a UN effort to the calling for restoration, uh, replanting of forests, and we use that as a blueprint or what national plans have for recreating corridors, we could put hundreds of millions of people to work around the world, growing nurseries of native species, restoring these corridors and both drawing down the carbon that we need to do, uh, as well as restoring corridors for nature. So that's, that's a really clear outcome um, of this, but it has to be done using native species uh, and planted in uh, ecologically sensitive ways. So along river courses, uh, up and down mountainsides that are natural paths that species will follow and we can solve both problems at once. Thanks, Eric. And Maurizio, it's the same question to you. What should journalists be asking um, about these projects from the perspective of Indigenous people and uh, ensuring that there is a social aspect to, to uh, environmental protection and restoration? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think the challenge is for um, 
participatory decision making at, um, at the local level to really take the local conditions and voices of local citizens, of course, including indigenous rural local communities, into full account when taking decisions at the, at the local level. I mean, the, the CBD is itself based on the ecosystem approach. And uh, one of the key uh, fundamental aspects of the ecosystem approach is that decision-making should be taken at the lowest level possible where biodiversity is. So a recognition that IPLCs play a huge amount, uh, a huge role, um, you know, in all of the 20 IT targets in conservation, sustainable use, restoration is a first very important step because it has not really happened yet. Um, so that's, that's the first thing to happen. The second one is to really uh, support the collective actions at the, at the local level with um, shifting away from uh, perverse incentives to support collective action at the local level that contributes to objectives to the objectives of, of, the, of the convention but also uh, the representation, for example, on the, on the bodies uh, at, the, at the national level in terms of implementation and monitoring of the, of the convention. But as Eric was saying, it's not just the convention here. We really need to go beyond because uh, biodiversity is intrinsically linked to achieving the sustainable development goals in addressing climate change and all those uh, challenges that humankind is facing at the moment. So it's got to be a much more holistic approach and not seeing things in silos, uh, because one of the challenges and the blockages that we have, we have faced um, at the local level, at the national level, is that you know, sometimes there are intense struggles amongst ministries. Uh, are, there are political struggles, there are struggles over resources. And uh, this one is, is a challenge that has got to bring everybody together uh, across government and really across society. And um, I, I actually like to thank um, uh, Nirmal as well for his comment because the role of youth in this is absolutely essential. And it's not just a matter of, um, you know, while, while protected areas you know, may still play an important role, but everybody has got to play a role in conserving and sustainably using biodiversity in all of our local areas, whether they are protected or not, because biodiversity is culturally spread out everywhere. And if we want to achieve Vision 2050 of living in harmony with nature, that harmony has got to be achieved across the board, everywhere where we are, and not only in some specific part of the planet, Although, you know, I agree that um, some specific part of the planet may receive more attention. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And Eric, I've had another question that I think uh, you may be best placed to answer. This is from Ramesh Bushal in, in Nepal. Uh, he says, uh, when we're talking about conservation, it's often about the, the, the mega species that have been more in the limelight. So how can uh, we bring in a balance of the investments that have been spent on mega species and that have left the other species far behind? Uh, namaste, Ramesh, uh, Sanchei Nounsa. Uh, I've lived in Nepal for many years, it's my second home. So um, yes, it's a great question. Uh, I, I think that you know one of the data layers, the, the way that we do that is really by if people go to the, um, the Global Safety Net app and watch the video um, that was produced explaining the different data layers or go to the Guardian article that came out uh, just a few weeks ago that does an animation of that, it shows how in many cases uh, there's some spatial discordance, there, there, there's, some, there's some unevenness. Uh, if we focus just on where large mammals occur, which are the iconic species that many conservation groups focus on, they tend to be distributed in certain areas, but the other spe the smaller species, those that have very narrow ranges that have always been rare evolutionarily, um, they may be in different habitats. So we have to have, what we need is a comprehensive biodiversity strategy that combines all of that. And that's what the safety net does. So the first six biodiversity layers of the safety net address those rare endemic species from plants to animals 
all included. And then other layers address the more wide ranging species. So that's how to do it is we have to make this comprehensive. So it's a great question, but um, it's, it's actually going to be, it, it requires, as I said, much less area to conserve those rare species, um, only 2.3% of the land area. Now, having said that we only have 15% protected and that's disappointing, I should say that what our data also show us is that 15% actually does a fairly good job of protecting a lot of the rare species on earth, at least on paper. So adding only another 2.3% gets us an easy way out of the extinction crisis if we act now. Thank you, Eric. And uh, we've got quite a few questions coming in now. I'm just gonna send one over to you, David. Uh, how can we compare the role of indigenous and modern knowledge for biodiversity at a local level? I don't think it's a question of comparing it. I think it's a matter of looking at uh, the complementarity uh, of the knowledge uh, and how these different systems can work together uh, to understand the relationships uh, at the local level. I mean, as you know, we've, we've pointed out is that there's been under the convention process you know, a recognition of the importance of traditional knowledge associated with conservation right from the very beginning, Article 8J and all of its provisions have been an important part of the CBD process. Um, I think the world has recognized that too. If you look at under the IPBES process, there's an important element about uh, recognizing and incorporating uh, and combining traditional knowledge with uh, other knowledge systems as well. So uh, I don't think it's a matter of comparing. And just like Ma I think Maurizio said, he, I'm glad he raised the ecosystem uh, approach because I think what you need to look at is when you're in real examples of you know, conservation sustainable use at the ecosystem level, you know, I think it's important to bring together the different communities and different knowledge systems and seeing what do they tell each other about ways of managing conservation uh, and sustainable use. Um, I think we have a ways to go though in terms of managing uh, the way that these are complemented, but I mean, I think there's an openness to that. Thanks. If I could just add to that, Mike, I think the single most important thing we can do to probably conserve life on earth, uh, to stabilize the climate, is to support the efforts of indigenous peoples to have ownership and management of their lands. It, it's, it's the single greatest contribution. And that's also great because it doesn't, not to, not to disparage at all the CBD and the role of governments, but if we have another venue, another alternative to really reach the targets, given how short the time frame is, investing in indigenous peoples is, our, is really the, one of the best things we can do. Thanks, Eric. If I, yeah, if I could just um, completely agree with that. And uh, I think it would actually be good um, for uh, parties. I don't know if there are many parties in the, in, the, uh, in the webinar today, but actually to look on how that could be fully integrated in, um, in target one of the proposed global post 2020 global diversity framework, which is about is a special, a special planning um target and if we put that in because we also feel that of course there are no silver bullets and you know it's going to be a mix of, of policies and approaches but we think that one of the most promising way is um is by fully securing the the the, the rights to land and resources of iplc's because that would contribute immensely and the other thing i also agree with what um uh, David said about traditional knowledge and, um, and science, absolutely, the way forward is for complementarity and working together and partnerships. And something already very good has been developing at the global level, both in the CBD and IBES. I think the challenge is on how to translate it in um, implementation at the national and local level. And that's one of the things that uh, we work with um, uh, with, the, with local partners in, in, you know, in a number of countries. Thanks. Thanks, Maurizio. Maurizio and, and you mentioning the, the, the draft targets uh, has reminded me that journalists who are listening in may not be aware that you can go online and you can find this document. It's the what's called the update of the zero draft of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And it contains uh, much of the text that we've been talking about today, including the list of the uh, targets and the goals that are being negotiated and will be finalized in the weeks and months ahead. 
So you can find that online on the uh, website of the CBD Secretariat, and I'll include a link to it in the chat as well. Um, David, there's one specific question about something you mentioned in the presentation, um, and that is about the fisheries management and sustainably managed stocks. Uh, the question is, do you have any more specific insight into which countries or regions have been successful in implementing sustainable policies and having good results, uh, or indeed areas where progress has not been so speedy? You'd have to really drill down within the uh, GBO to look at that specifically. But I think what we've seen is we've seen some examples of regional fisheries where we've seen good examples. So, for example, in the case of Spain, there have been some actually really positive work in terms of some local regional fisheries where we've seen sustainability move forward. Um, I know that one of the case studies, which is it's a bit dramatic, but it's one looking at is how in the case of Indonesia, um, there were some uh, rather dramatic enforcement mechanisms uh, that were used to deal with uh, with the issues of sustainable fisheries. And that was along the lines of the ministry uh, blowing up the boats of uh, fisher folk who were, um, or of uh, illegal fishing things uh, as a measure to, to talk about enforcement moving forward. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the important lesson you got when you drill down to there is that where you've actually had this management where you've brought together the, the fisher communities, um, local communities and integrate into bigger questions uh, into the, the, the actual specific ecosystems, that's where it has worked. Um, so I think it brings back to the question of like, where's the level of management, where's the engagement of communities uh, and how that moves forward, because that's where we've seen the successes. You know, unfortunately, we're still seeing tremendous overfishing and destructive fishing pr practices in other parts of the ocean ecosystem. And that's probably because we're not looking at that ability to bring it down to, to a lower level. So I'd invite people to drill down and look in GBO5 and they'll be able to look at some of these, some of these examples. Mike, can I give a, a scientific take on that? Um, sure. So, uh, Essentially, we are fishing most of the major fisheries to commercial extinction around the world. It's that, that uh, only when they become unprofitable um, to try and fish because there's so few of them. There's an alternative. And my colleague Enrique Sala, the esteemed marine biologist from National Geographic, who's really, it's, it's his data that show this. Um, Essentially, uh, if, we, if we create, there's, there's also a companion effort to rapidly increase the size of marine protected areas. But marine protected areas are slightly different than terrestrial ones because we go and we harvest things from marine protected areas, but we don't have to do that all over the marine protected area. So what Enrique and his colleagues are arguing for is at least 10% of, of the nearshore marine be set aside as no take zones. And the reason is, is that the fishery, the species that, that their life history is such, where they breed essentially, um, where they grow up are in these no take zones and then they disperse, they swim out and they can be caught by the fishing fleets elsewhere. It turns out that no take zones produce six times the fish biomass inside the no take zone as outside. So having this spillover effect is really beneficial to the ecosystem, to the fisheries and it restores these fisheries as well. So that's what we need to do. We need to bring more science into the management of the fisheries. Um, but we also have to stop these, these corrupt illegal practices. We are, we are mining the ocean. It, it's in the marine realm that we actually go and harvest all the predators in that system, which is something we don't, we don't eat the predators typically in the terrestrial realm. We do in the marine. That's where the valuable fisheries are. So we have to, if we, if we do these no take zones, the results are dramatic and fast. That's what we have to do. There, there's one more part of the puzzle that I that I want to mention too, which is that you know on the layer of perverse incentives and illegal subsidies, or not even late, but just subsidies overall, um, subsidies to fuel that pertains to most of the world's fishing fleets end up producing uh, an overabundance of capacity uh, for fishing as well. So if the world also is ready to address uh, perverse incentives and the subsidies of fuel, uh, you could make a big difference because you would stop making it profitable to expand fisheries capacity. Thanks. And if we take that one step further, uh, it's estimated somewhere between, uh, I'll give you the range, 20 billion to $750 billion a year that go to fossil fuel subsidies. If we just took some of that, that can pay for the global safety net. We don't even have to go and appropriate new money if we had the political will to redirect those fossil fuel subsidies that are only making the whole situation much worse more quickly, we can solve this problem. 
and many other problems too, Eric. I think um, the the question of subsidies has come up again and again over the years, and we keep hearing some governments and and into international organizations making the right noises but we don't often see much in the way of action on subsidies i think it's it's one of the things that we have to really get to grips with not only for biodiversity but also for the climate as well uh, i'm really conscious of time now and i know that Maurizio has to head off so i'm going to draw things to a close now i want to thank you all so much for for, for all of your insights and for answering these questions that we've had. For people who are listening in, uh, we haven't managed to get to all of your questions, but we will be uh, sharing the information and the, the details with how you can get in touch with Eric, David and Maurizio. Uh, if you want to follow up with them, if you want to arrange interviews with them, um, I'm, I'm sure that they will be willing. I haven't asked them yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure they'll all be up for a bit of that. And um, Thank you. I think maybe we should have more of these webinars that are a bit longer as well so we can get through more questions. But uh, it's been really, really interesting for me and I hope for the audience attending as well. Thank you all for, for coming along and I'll be in touch with you all as a follow up after this is closed. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Great. Thank you very, very much. Everyone be safe and have a very good day and week. Thanks, David.